Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Welcome, technocrats. Come on in and take your shoes off. Put your feet up on the lounge and get nice and comfy. We're going to let Matthew Dickerson sidle up to us and whisper sweetly into our ears for the next hour and a Sorry, next half an hour. Getting ahead of myself there. Uh, all about the latest bibs and bobs from the tech industry. Welcome to Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. How are you, Matt? Oh, sounding like I'm a bit ready to go to sleep there. I'm all <laughs> snuggled up, curled up in my bean bag here and got the little <laughs> blankie over the top of me and uh, I'm sitting back ready to listen to what we've got to say this week. But I have actually been away the last few days and one of the things that I found interesting in terms of the way we solve problems going forward was so many cafes now have the QR code in the middle of the table, of scan course. the QR code, yeah. get the menu and you go and do your individual orders. And I went, oh, that's nice, no big deal, it's just a different way of doing things. But I spoke to some younger members of our society, late teens, early 20s sort of members of our society, and they love it because they used to always have the problem when you go to a cafe with a few friends, uh-huh. oh, how do we do the payment? The cafe doesn't want to do split bills, so then we've got to work out some way that the four of us sitting around either divide it evenly amongst yeah, of the course. four of us. Because back in the 90s, we would pull out our 20-cent pieces and our coins and <laughs> our dollars, right. you know, all that sort of and, – and you'd be able to split the bill. There'd be a little bit of quibbling, but people would be reaching into that pool of cash and dividing out. No one carries cash these days. No one carries cash, and so you've got that problem where how do we pay? One person might be brave and say, yeah. I'll put it all on my – my card, and you guys just pay me back. You transfer the money to me, will you? Sure or you, or thing. Or you inch your way up to the the checkout, and you you ask them really, really politely, and they have to really politely say, "No, we don't split the bill." And, mm, yeah, all oh. that sort of thing. So now, what I found out from sitting down at a cafe with a few of these younger people is that effectively every person just pulls out their own phone and scans the QR code and orders exactly what they want off that menu for the cafe they're sitting at, and then they do the payment on the phone. And that's it. So they don't have to worry about that. It's not a hassle. But the other thing, I spoke to a couple of the actual waiters, wait people, and they said that they don't get people who run away without paying the bill anymore, which Ah, didn't happen that often, but they said it used to happen occasionally. And they don't always think it was deliberate. It was just sometimes people had a good time, had a few drinks, and up they get, and off they go, and oh. Did you pay? Oh, I thought you paid, James. Oh, no, did you want me to pay? I oh, know. So Is they've taken wrong? that out of the equation as well. So that's a good thing as well. So it's amazing how our society just adapts to whatever's thrown at us and we come up with new solutions. And I really can't see us going back to the old days where you give a human an order and then pay at the end of the meal. Mm, I just think yeah. we've moved on from that. And we might have done away with those freeloaders at the end of a meal. They go, oh, I'm... A bit short of cash yeah, right now. Right. You can't order it if you can't pay for it. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I've got my card. I left my car be fine. My phone's gone flat. And yeah, so Actually, I think that you're was onto much. a large <laughs> part of the time. So sucks to be everyone else now. I'm through that phase and uh, you're beauty. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it's, it's good to see different technology in use. I love it. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And the QR code just won't go away. No, it won't. It won't. It's here forever <laughs> until they come up with another one, the next level. Well, thanks for plugging in today, people. You're not going to regret it. Stay tuned for the eStream camper as the great outdoors gets the EV touch. We'll throw Elon Musk under the bus because he's just such an easy target as Starlink grows a little more. And we're going to give you a better option than the bin for all you use AAA batteries. But let's go to a story that deals with matters of the heart first up. At the time of recording, recording, the documentary film The Tinder Swindler is at number seven on the Australian Netflix chart. Number one worldwide, though. It's a film just now uh, that, if you haven't seen it, it may be worth a look. It's a true crime documentary about the vulnerability and the the emotional investment that comes with a search for a romantic match. But this film also brings to light the reality for anyone who's ever been hustled by a prospective partner. And in Australia alone, people looking for a genuine companionship have been hustled out of more than $56 million in romance scam, scams just last year. Matt, this is humanity at its cruelest and most basic level. A predator always preys on the most vulnerable. And I don't want to give away the end to Tinder Swindler because I do advise that people watch it. And I don't get much time to watch TV, but this one... I watched it last night. It is a cracker of a doco. It is, and it's almost compulsory viewing because when we talk to people about scams, and we do a little bit on this podcast because we want people to be 
aware and just to be alert, I suppose, is the main thing there. And so we do talk about them a little bit. And some people give me some feedback and they say, oh, yeah, I heard about that scam, but no one would fall for that scam, would they? Surely Mm. not. But when you watch the Tinder swindler, what you quickly learn is that anyone, seemingly intelligent people, seemingly sophisticated people that have got good jobs, anyone can be swindled out of money. So it can be a little old lady who gets swindled out of $50 or it can Mm. be someone who thinks they're a high exec business person and they get swindled out of $50 or $50 million. Who knows the amounts there? But when you watch that Netflix documentary, it really drove home to me that, wow, these guys are good. You learn about what vulnerability really is, and it comes it stems out of just a desire to want to believe something, that uh, we intrinsically, I guess, want to see the good side of humans. And then when you make a new friend or uh, you know, a new romantic partner, um, this thing just didn't happen in a, in a click. It was a case of a build-up over time with lots of evidence to support their misunderstanding mm. um, of, of the person they were working with. And, and never never be tricked by the fact that these people are professionals. This mm. is what they do. They plan, they plot, they scheme, and they're good at it. So the figure you threw at me then is a scary figure, isn't it? $56 million. Just in Australia. We lost, Australians lost in last year. But that figure from Scamwatch, they believe – only about 13% of scams, and this is romance scams we're talking about, are reported. Now, mm. I'm a bit confused about that number, the 13%, because if they're unreported, you know, like How they're unreported. Do you know what the unknown is? <laughs> That's yeah. right. So yeah. somehow, it's an scam watchers, estimate to make. Yeah, it is. Scam watchers have come up with this figure that only 13% of romance scams last year were, were reported. So if that's $56 million, then logically that turned into about $430 million well, that people were scammed out of last year in romance scams alone. That's what we're talking about, just romance scams. Well, I wonder if there was some a couple of those predators out there that actually they were tracking and they knew that they, those predators were accessing money from people and um, those people never reported that money going missing at all. It maybe. could be. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. I've tried but, to find um, out from Scamwatch how they came up with that 13%, but I haven't been able to get a... Mm. Definitive answer on that. But let, let's take it at face value. That's $430 million that we lost as Aussies last year in romance scams. Wow. And the ones that were reported, 3,400 were reported. So if you break that down to $56 million, that's about fifteen grand on average. So you think, well, that's a lot of money, $15,000. For some people, that would be a huge amount of money. For some people, a bit smaller. Mm. But still, it's not like, can you give us 50 bucks to go and buy a carton of beers? Mm. It's significant money. When someone starts asking for... 15,000. 15, and it might be in a few goes. It might be, can I just have 1,000? And can I get another 5,000? I'm going to need a new car. Can you help me get that? Yeah, <laughs> that sort of that's stuff. Right, yeah. Yeah. Are you asking me now? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, <laughs> while well, well, you're out there. But people, it's not unusual for them to go through a series of transactions and build up 15, 20, 100, 200. It just seems incredible. But again, when you watch Tinder Swindler, you realize how easy it can happen. And again, as much mm. as we all think, that would never happen to us. Mm. That would happen to someone else. It can happen to all of us. So well, it, it's the a- guy was organised, and that's that's the key. But people are organised out there, and you know the the big predators, they know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't have any absolute advice about how to stop it because again, these guys are good. But what I would say is, listen to your friends. Mm. You might not pick up the red flags because, as you said, you are potentially in a vulnerable state. Mm. You might be just looking for a connection. You might wanting be wanting to believe something. And when your friends say, James, are you really sure this is a good idea? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then when you start trying to explain it to your friends and you start to go, gee, my explanations here are getting a bit thin on the ground and your friends yeah. are going, James, I just think you should think about this a bit more, then maybe that would be one way that I would see that potentially – you could do it. If you're too embarrassed to tell your friends what you're doing, that might be a red flag That's for yourself. That's a big red flag, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, anyway, it is, it is scary. It's a lot of money. Well, well, and it goes to show that sometimes you'll, you'll, um, you'll have some evidence and you'll want to believe it so badly that you'll just go with that evidence. Yeah. Uh, that the person's a good person and they've got all well-meaning intentions. But those independent parties, your friends, your family that are saying, look, objectively looking at that evidence – yeah, it's still a little bit. How you it's going. probably almost a case of confirmation bias, isn't it? You're looking yes. for that confirmation of this being the correct thing to do, and you'll grab any scant evidence you can that backs up that, despite all this other evidence to the contrary. Mm. So, yeah, listen to your friends, look for red flags, just be careful with it. What my dream is, my utopian dream, is that we get so good at spotting these scams that we don't actually get swindled out of our money. 
And eventually these people that are doing all this swindling, all these con artists, they've obviously got a talent there. They're using it mm. in a bad way at the moment. Eventually I want them to make no money of what they're doing and they've got to use those talents for good. Yeah. And I wake up and have my cornflakes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. On to something a little bit more light. When the Super Bowl comes around each year, American football fans go bananas. And so do the advertisers. It's no secret that advertising spots are pretty pricey, about $7 million bucks for a brief 30 seconds, and that means pretty high stakes are at play. No surprise is that they tend to feature A-list celebs and a, they cost a bajillion bucks to produce. Well, the cryptocurrency trading service known as Coinbase took a bit of a gamble, and they put together a very cheap ad as a trade-off for giving away an easy 15 bucks worth of free cryptocurrency. Matt, how's that panned out for them? Fantastically and terribly, all at the same <laughs> <Right>. time. <laughs> it was a brilliant piece of marketing because, as you said, most of these Super Bowl ads are like a Hollywood production. Mm. They've only got, say, 30 seconds. It's $7 million bucks for 30 seconds. Then you don't want to have too long an ad. So you might only have a 30-second ad, maybe a 60-second ad. So they grab some Hollywood stars, they grab some Hollywood producers, directors, whatever. And they've often got a story, so you've got to have writers behind them as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. So all this together. And one thing I did like was the fact that there were lots of EV ads, lots of EVs that no. maybe aren't available at the moment, but lots of EV ads that went into the production. But again, they were using all these famous people and all this great production. Coinbase said, we're going to go back to basics. We're going to have a black screen and just a square that bounces around on screen, a bit like a Windows screensaver, Windows 3.1 oh, yeah, screensaver. Yeah, I remember those. It used yeah. to just be a box that would bounce around, or you could put some words there. Absolutely, sit there and watch it for hours. I'm sure many employees did do that and watch it for hours. <laughs> so they just put a QR code on screen that bounced around, and then the colour changed. The QR code again, yeah. yeah <laughs> of right. course, what else could it be? <laughs> but it changed colour when it bounced in different points. And I actually saw some footage of some different Super Bowl uh, parties that were going on where people were betting what colour it would change to as it bounced around. So <laughs> travelling its way around the screen, when it would get to another corner, it would change from orange to green, for example, and people were in the room, you could see them betting, it's going to be orange, it's going to be green, it's going to be blue. Oh, yes, buy and one. So it was something that got people pretty excited. But then, obviously, someone said, you know what, there's a QR code. I know yes. what to do with the QR code. Yeah. I've got to pull my phone out and I've got to scan the QR code. So brilliant marketing. The only minor problem was it was way more successful than Coinbase thought it would be, and their servers crashed. So, <laughs> so they were giving away, as you said, $15 of cryptocurrency, which yeah, some right. people may say is giving away $15 of nothing, but I won't go into that discussion now. Yeah. But $15 of cryptocurrency, come and use our service or create an account with our service, $15 of something for nothing that's worth nothing but mm. whatever. And they had a huge success. They had so many people coming to do it that their but servers crashed. They couldn't crashed handle the, the workload. It was a great bit of marketing without maybe the technical expertise to go behind it. And what I did love is that the famous US whistleblower, Edward Snowden, he actually posted about this because he found it absolutely hilarious. And he said, they've just paid $40 million for a 60-second ad to give themselves their own denial of service attack. So it's one of the things that people do when they're trying to stop people attacking their organisation sometimes is yeah. make sure they've got this ability to prevent a denial of service. And that's when you just bombard one company with so much traffic that it makes it useless. No one else can get onto that particular website. So they've effectively <laughs> launched their own denial of service attack. They've paid $40 million in advertising. Obviously, they paid some marketing company $20 to put a bouncing QR code around the screen as well. Yeah. And that was it. The whole thing crashed. Anyway, they got it up and going relatively quickly. It was a huge success. We're still talking about it now. And that's right. Sometime that's the after thing. the Super Bowl. So some people said, either very cleverly, cleverly or cynically, did they actually deliberately crash their service? So we'd talk about it for longer. Uh -huh. I'm not thinking they went that far in their planning. <laughs> I just think they didn't guess how many people would go and try and use their service. So well done to them. Good little clever ad. And sometimes it just shows getting back to the basics is all you need to do. Mm, yeah, you don't have to do, go too complicated. Now, how many batteries do you throw out in a month or a year even? On the back of the packaging, a, a tiny little symbol implores us not to throw them into the general waste, but... In landfills around the globe, there has to be millions of tonnes of these little environmentally poisonous pills leaking their contents into the soil profile. We all know that we've needed it for a long time now, but prioritising battery recycling is a big deal, and Australia is stepping things up. Launching a new plan for recycling batteries, wait for it, it's called 
B-Cycle. Matt, there is more to this than the tacky name, yes? Well, I like the name. What do you mean, tacky name? I think it's a clever name. <laughs> Marketing genius. <laughs> Marketing genius, that's right. CSIRO actually said that only 2% of all our annual lithium-ion battery waste is recycled. I'm wow. actually surprised it's even that much. Mm. I, I think most people just go, lithium-ion battery, I just do it's, what I do with alkaline batteries. All, yep, bang. Throw it in the bin. So this is where this whole B-cycle concept has come up. On launch day, which has just happened, 2,351 local drop-off points are now available. So they're in popular supermarkets, your Coles, your Woolies, your Aldi's, at places like Bunnings. So a whole range of different places you can drop these batteries off to, which is fantastic because you've got to make it convenient and easy for people to use or they're not going to use it. So take those lithium-ion batteries, drop them in there. They'll be then taken and recycled. Now, recycling is often difficult and sometimes cost you more money. But if you can make collection points where it's gathered in large amounts very easily, you've solved one of the problems, which is getting the yeah. raw materials to actually do it. And we're going to get to the point at some stage in the future where mining these items that we need for these batteries is going to become more and more expensive as it's harder to get some of those mines. So starting it now before we're in that desperation stage is very sensible. So we kind of hold off on that desperate need that we have, although we do have a fairly desperate need. I have been asked a couple of points about it, and I just want to make the point here that's very important. This isn't designed for the lithium-ion battery in your car. So do not drive your car. After you've driven it for a long time and the battery's degraded, do not drive it into your local supermarket and say, here you go, here's the battery from my car, have a nice day. It is really designed for those small batteries in your drones or in your cameras or the yeah. small devices that you have because those lithium-ion batteries are great and they last for a while and then they get to the point where – They've just degraded to the point where your device doesn't run for very long. So what do you do? You often throw it in the bin. So now mm. throw it into B-Cycle. Good move. And lots of different agencies and organizations coming together to make this happen. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's just a basic, fairly fairly basic initiative, isn't it? It is really just to collect all that material, those raw materials in the first place, and then do something with it. It's good for jobs. It's good for our waste industry. It might even create a whole industry out of this because not a lot of places around the world are doing this recycling on mm. those small lithium-ion batteries because, again, it's hard to justify the expense of going through the process because they're only small. Mm. Mining it when you're getting those quantities out of the mines might be a bit easier. But, again, this is looking towards the future. Mm. EVs wrecking the weekend. It was a pretty dumb idea, a, a, a throwaway line from a group of ill-informed pollies that we can well and truly put to bed now. Or not. Matt, let's rub that lack of foresight right back in their faces one more time while you introduce us to the eStream camper concept. What is this new machine and how's it going to make the EV deniers cranky yet again? <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> this is made by Airstream, which is not really that well known in Australia, but Airstream make camper vans, as in bands you tow around and they're fairly modern, sophisticated, they look pretty groovy, they're typically shiny silver and they all uh, are popular in America. But what they've done here is they've said, we've heard some of the concerns about the future of EVs and what it might mean for our campers. Oh no, we don't yeah. want people to stop hitching on these campers and taking them with them to wherever they're going to go. Yeah. Let's make effectively an EV compatible camper. And now having said that, you can use this camper with any vehicle. It doesn't have to be an EV, but they've made it specifically around people that they think are going to be interested in this because they probably own an EV. Mm. What they've got for a start is a big battery in the EV and powered wheels. So rather than you say, oh, I'm going to have to hook up that camper van to my EV and my range is going to drop. Yeah, I'm going to lose 30% of my range because I've got this big heavy camper I'm going to tow. This has got a very clever mechanism that links the ball joint to the actual camper van so that if it's putting any pressure on that ball point or on that connection there, the batteries and the motor in the camper power the van ever so wow. slightly. So it's not pushing it along from behind, otherwise you might get a bit out of control driving. It's got a very delicate mechanism there that's providing just the right amount of power so that effectively the EV range or the range on your EV shouldn't change. So if you can get 500 kilometres out of your truck, your ute, then you can probably get 500 kilometres out of it towing this as well. Yeah, so cool. that's the first thing that makes a lot of sense, so that sounds pretty good. The second thing is when you get there, you can use this thing for all the things that you might want to do around the campsite. It's got an 80 kilowatt hour battery on board, so unless you use all of that power up in getting to wherever you're going to go to, then presumably you've got some left over. If you had a full battery when you arrive somewhere, you've got the ability to run everything in this camper van, the air conditioning, 
or your stove, your different electrical components in there, charge your phone, everything in there can be run from that battery for over a week. Mm. If you turn off the air conditioning, which is the main user of power, the the Airstream themselves say that effectively you can go forever because it's a big battery, but it's also got some solar panels on the roof. And when you're using other things, for example, your phone, you might charge it with your phone, doesn't use much, or you're using some of the high power things like a kettle, for example, well, it only needs a couple of minutes to boil that water. So it's not like it's draining battery power for a long period of time. Mm. So you park this out in the sun, you go off grid, you go out camping out in the bush somewhere, you can probably live there indefinitely, depends how good you are catching fish, I suppose, but you can live there for a long time because you've got this whole camper ready to go. So it sounds like a really great idea, and it also sounds a bit soft, doesn't it? A bit of glamping, <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. You'd have to go and collect the firewood. You'd have to say to the kids, that's it, sorry, your phones have gone flat now. You're going to have to stop using your phone <laughs> for the week we're out here camping. You can just keep doing things as you would normally do in modern society, but you're out there in the bush in this beautiful camper. So it sounds like a really good idea. And we're preserving the great Aussie weekend. It's alive and well. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, and, and I can just imagine the various things they would have. We've seen some of the other Rivian-type vehicles where you've got, uh, what are they called, the stoves? Um, I've got induction. One. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So you've got the Rivian, which has got a stove that pulls out, which is an induction stove. I Very imagine, energy efficient. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I imagine this would be the same. It'd have things like an induction stove. So forget about that firewood. Forget about burning some timber and cooking your billy can over the fire. You'd have all these modern conveniences, but you're out there with nature. And you can also feel guilt-free because you're using an EV with batteries that you presumably have charged up with solar panels or with some form of renewable energy. Mm. So you're not harming the environment while you're doing all this. So I just think it's a brilliant idea. As I said, yes, can be towed by any vehicle, but it's really designed for those EV-conscious ones out there. The weekend of the future. Mm, it does sound good. Now, I know I came a little bit late into it, but I've gotten into Wordle. I've been bitten by the bug, <laughs> good, good. and I get the appeal. <laughs> It's a really simple game design, and you know it's not that big a commitment. One game per day. Yeah. But the New York Times have added their own little special touch to it, and it's been tainted. Matt, am I alone here? There is something in this, right? I wonder how our Wordler listeners are also feeling. Yeah, I think not very happy is really the bottom line for it. We did talk about the fact recently that the New York Times has bought Wordle from Josh Wardle, and they paid a few million dollars for it. Happy days to Josh. Good luck to him. But... Logically, you think there's going to be some model mm. they're going to have where they make money out of it. Put it behind a firewall or paywall. Put it behind something where you're going to have to pay to use it or advertising on the screen, whatever. So put that aside for the moment. The New York Times promised that the wordplay would stay the same with Wordle. They wouldn't mm. change it. They wouldn't give you more guesses or less guesses. It would all be the same. And that lasted about a week. And now <laughs> they've changed the list of words. So you might say, oh, you're being a bit pedantic there about changing the play of the game. But it does change the play of the game because the it dynamic. means yeah. the words that you can put in as a guess, even if the solutions might have changed, the word list has changed. So they've taken out some of the words. Now, it's political correctness gone a bit over the top maybe. For example, they've removed the word wench. It's oh. a five-letter word that Josh Wardle had in the list of allowable words, again, for your guess, or it might be a solution one day. I don't think wench is necessarily the worst word you could possibly have. I can understand why there might be some reservations about it, but we're not calling someone a wench. We're just saying, here is a five-letter word in a That's game. Right. Yep. Slave is another one they've yeah, taken right. out. Is that getting overly sensitive? Yeah, I think am I being probably a, is. A bit, yeah. bit, uh, am I being insensitive here? But I just, again... I don't think the idea of having slaves is a good idea, James. No, but, but the but word you don't slave have to. itself, and I'm probably still going to use the word slave at some stage in society when I explain to my kids things that used to happen in days of yore, and this is the sort of environment that used to happen. And it might be used to, to describe something very negative, yeah? It could be, but also when you've got arrangements in uh, braking systems, for example, mm. you'll often have a piston master and a piston slave yeah, yeah, in, a, right. in a one-sided braking environment. So surely the word slave could still be used without being offensive in modern society. There's a few other words that I won't mention on the podcast because we want this to be family-friendly. So a few other words they've taken out, which I kind of understand why, but it does change the wordplay. And also they've done a thing that 
oh, I really don't like. They've taken some of the English spelt words and turned them into American spelt words. Yeah. So fibre is one of them. So yeah. fibre, F-I-B-R-E, has yeah. now been changed to F-I-B-E-R. I really don't like when Aussies use American spelling. And so this now you have to think. You've got to think like American. Think, oh, can we do that? Can we? <laughs> <laughs> is well, that possible? I don't know if it's if it's just me, but I reckon the words they've been choosing over the last six days or so, they're different to the sorts of words that they would have had. Yeah, you know, I'm only new to the game, I know. But yeah, words that you don't tend to use in common vernacular. Yeah. Yeah. And I well, just. Funnily enough. Not that I'm using the words wench and slave a whole lot. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, there's just, yeah, some words that, I don't know. It's like New York. City, uh, sorry, the New York Times, you've got your big crossword, and that's where you can show how clever you are. That's right. <laughs> Maybe this one is just for the general public to just have a bit of fun with. Well, it's interesting because that's been one of the common complaints that people have had since the New York Times took it over. Yeah, right. And the New York Times have said, no, the list of words that are there have stayed, in other words, the solutions that Josh already had ready to go, All right. have stayed apart from, we've had to take some of these out, which is then change some of the solutions because one of these might have been a solution coming up. So it has changed at least. But they're saying, now this is the New York Times. They're just I'm not, his words. I'm not saying that this is <laughs> correct or incorrect. I'm just telling you what they're reporting. Right. They're saying that we not uh, have not suddenly gone and made the words harder, the solutions harder. We've just gone along with the list but made some changes to the word list. So mm. take that at face value. Believe them or not, whatever my, you like. My confirmation bias. <laughs> yeah, that's otherwise. right. <laughs> um, yeah, I just know that I, you know, for the for a long time there, I was getting them in three goes, maybe four goes. Now I'm going down to five and six. Yeah. So the official word from the New York Times is all they've changed is they've removed the obscure words to keep the puzzle accessible to more people, mm. as well as insensitive or offensive words. So what was the it the word. other day? The other day I had, and I'm going to complain about this. The <laughs> final word I think it was swill. But if you got the S and the I and the double L's, then there's about four or five other options you could have gotten. And then you're just swinging in the breeze. That's aren't right. You? You're just having a guess. And I don't like having uh, a guess in games at no. night. You need some sort of intellect or talent to get there. So, <laughs> yeah, the problem is you need to get that swill word, the options there. For example, mm. swell was another one that yeah. you could have. But oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, so you need to get that earlier in the list because then you get to that point where it is a bit of a guess. Well, it could be swill, it could be swell. Swill. And out of those two, I'd say swell would be more common. So I'd probably go swell first. Oh, look, we went through the list of spill, still, skill, and all that <laughs> sort of stuff. I don't know. It just annoyed me. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to back off from the New York Times and I'm going to give him a break now. Matt, I'm reading an, a headline here that says EV charges for V2, V2G and V2H have finally started to arrive in Australia after some heavy delays. Now, don't get me wrong. I think this is fabulous news. But what the hell is V2G and V2H? And what was the problem with V2E and F and everything that came before them? Well, that's right. We might need to see the New York Times and see if there's some letters they had to remove because they're offensive to someone. <laughs> but V2G is vehicle to grid. Oh, okay. And right. V2H is vehicle to home. Right. What? So the, V2E is nothing and V2F is... We can make up something yeah, okay. if you like. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Vehicle to electricity grid is V2E. There we go. Yeah, right. Why not? So the issue here is that for most people, their car, their electric vehicle, is used when they drive to work or to do the shopping. But most of the time it's sitting at their work or at their home. And it's a big battery. Mm. When people buy a battery to put in their home, so they've got some solar panels on, they want a battery, they even want to go completely off the grid or maybe just go so they're using the grid as little as possible, a battery is an important part of that because if they've got solar panels, for example, there's not a lot of sun around at night time, which everyone points out. So the battery's there to provide power when it haven't got it there. But a car has got a big battery. So some of those batteries you see people put in their homes, maybe 10 or 20 kilowatt hours, Batteries have sorry, cars have batteries that are 50, 70, 100 kilowatt hours. So if you had your car that you could just park in the garage and charge up during the day from your solar panels and then along comes night time and the car that could then be used to power your home, oh, now right. we're talking. Now that's a little bit specific because then you're sitting there at home with the car being used to power your home and you say, I'm just going to duck out and go to see a movie. Oh, don't take the car because we'll have no lights at home because you're going to take the battery. <laughs> well, it maybe limits how much you can use your car. Now in that scenario, you would still have your car your house, sorry, connected to the grid, and so you'd still be able to use normal grid power. It's just something to prevent you using grid power. But V2G is really important. So it's not as specific as vehicle to your home, but it's vehicle to the grid. So what it uses is lots of cars out there 
on the assumption oh, right. that oh, out of wow. all the cars out there, James is going to see a movie tonight, but Billy's not going to see a movie tonight. So out of all those cars out there, you've probably got enough still plugged in that there can be enough power provided to the grid from all these cars that have charged up during the day that you're then getting that power at night time. Without draining the power overnight to, to nothing, and so you can still drive the car to work the next day. That's exactly right. Now, we're a long way from getting to that point where that's useful, but it was even further from getting to that point because we had no charges that you could use in Australia that were licensed to use in Australia that would actually allow this two-way powering. So any charges you bought in the past, they could go one direction. They'd go from your solar panels or from the grid into your car, and that was the end of the story. So now, finally, we've got V2G and V2H charges that are available in Australia, so you can actually go and buy one of those, have it installed in your home right now, bi-directional chargers if you like, if you don't want to use those little initialisms of V2G and V2H. Uh, Jet Charge is a company that's got the first delivery, but there will be other companies as well that have got those deliveries. So you'll buy one of those, you'll plug it in, but then you'll need a car that can actually work with the V2G or V2H system. Unfortunately, only one car at the moment. Uh-huh. Nissan Leaf is the only car that can oh, do right. it. Now they had a I trial. I thought you were going to say Tesla. Then no. I would have put money on your saying Tesla. <laughs> no, no, okay, yeah, fair Nissan enough. Nissan Leaf, and they actually had a trial in Canberra recently where they had. They asked for anyone that had a Nissan Leaf, and they ended up with about fifty cars lined up. They plugged them all in just to test the concept to see how well this would work, and mm. as it turned out, it worked pretty well. Again, only fifty. Not much they can do with only fifty. The idea is to get more and more of these. So the the big plan is twofold. One, let's get the charges in place, and then two let's get the cars that are going to be compatible. Now, the story is that most cars, by, say, the year 2025, are going to have this capability. If you're going to make an electric car in the future, you're going to build it so it can go in both directions because my competitors are going to have that feature. Mm. I don't want to be left out in the cold. I'll have to make sure I have that feature as well. To give you an idea of the numbers that you need, they say that if you got maybe 100,000 cars in Australia – then that might be enough for you to start to make a big impact on the grid. Now, last year, we've talked about the numbers. We sold about, I think it was just 12,900-odd. We talked about a previous episode, Tesla 3s. About 20,000 EVs in total. So we're not there yet. So we've got a little way to go. But by the year 2025, I think we'll get pretty close where you'll have maybe the number of cars you need, maybe more of these charges to go in, and then we can start to stabilise our grid out of cars parked in people's garages. The good part is, of course, you get paid when that money's going back to the grid, whether it's from solar panels or whether it's from your car, it doesn't matter. You're getting paid for that money to go back in the grid and you might get paid different amounts at different times of the day. So you might be able to get some power when there's lots of energy around, like during the middle of the day, solar panels, for example, and at night time, that electricity might be worth a little bit more so you can actually sell it back for a little bit more than you might have got paid for it during the middle of the day. Yeah, right. So a bit of financial incentive there too. Yeah, maybe. So long way to go and lots of very technical engineering components to get this right. But the potential's there. Step one, we've got the charges. Happy days. Yeah, a few right. steps to go. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what the next step will be after they've done this. Um, I, I find it very exciting. The last two years of the global pandemic have been like shaking the world inside a gigantic snow globe with nothing fixed in place. Modern society has had the absolute proverbial shaken out of it, and now that shaking, uh, now that it's starting to subside, we can see how things are beginning to settle out. And the way things tend to be done now looks very different to the way they did before February 2020, that's for sure. Matt, we've all got stories about our own workplaces, but you've been doing a bit of interesting reading about daycare in the UK, of all things. Yeah, that's right. I think they call them nurseries over there, although I hesitate yeah. to say nurseries because people think of trees when they hear nurseries in yeah, Australia. Yeah, yeah. But daycare centres in the UK, it used to be you'd come to pick up your child after they'd been in daycare and you'd talk to the particular person at the daycare centre. How did little Jimmy go today? Was he good? Was he well behaved? What sort of things did he do? How did he develop? Etc. Etc. Of course, none of that is allowed anymore. You don't Mm. want a parent walking into the centre because you want to keep people as far apart as possible. You don't want COVID being spread. So unfortunately, what parents were saying was they weren't getting any feedback on how their child in daycare was progressing. Now, I'm not sure if they expected them to learn Einstein's theory of relativity while they're in daycare, (laughs) but they want to know about a few little basic things. Are they playing nice with other kids? Have they learned a couple of letters of the alphabet maybe? Just how are they progressing? So, of course, a software solution came along. A software company started up, which obviously started selling its services to daycare centres, and now you're getting this 
daily diary of feedback sent to the parents at the end of each day so they can check electronically on an app on their phone to see how their beautiful little child is progressing, how they're playing with other children. And then it goes a step further. You can actually get the stage now where you can tap into this app real time Real During time. the oh, day, wow. at any stage. So I'm not sure how the staff at these centres feel about this. Not that I think they're being up to any terrible things, but you can imagine if their child or if your child has just fallen over and skinned their knee yeah. and they're crying just at the time you happen to tune in and there's this cry that you know definitely is your child and you're looking at the camera seeing this poor child crying on the ground oh, and no, no one there, <laughs> immediately you can just go, oh no, pull them out of that child guess what a terrible place it is. So I'm sure that there might be some nervousness amongst the staff, but the really interesting thing is just how we change solutions to the problems we have. So in the past, we might have said, okay, well, you can't get a physical or a verbal report one-on-one with one of the teachers here because we just can't be close to each other. So end of story. Now they're saying you can still get that like sort of report, maybe not perfectly, but you can still get something where you're actually getting some feedback on your child all driven by software. And where's it stop? How long before the kids are just having a tag put on when they come in in the morning and they're tracked as they move around the daycare centre. How many kilometres did your child walk around today? Uh, what were the decibels around them from crying from other kids? Who knows? Well, I can imagine that, that you know, you're employing four or five extra staff in your uh, your daycare centre um, just to keep track of what the kids are doing, just to give the feedback. And I can't imagine they would have the cameras on uh, in the in the, in the the rooms or anything because there's a certain duty of care and protection and all that mm. sort of stuff. But but people sort of just giving little you know, Twitter-sized little updates on how the kids are going through the day. Um, yeah, that could be a full-time job. You know, it could be, a yeah. A number of people, yeah. And there'll be, have to be another room there in the daycare centre and the prices for daycare will go up. <laughs> just go up. One thing I really did <laughs> did like about it was that you can then interact with the app when you take your child home so that you can continue the learning journey. Yeah, so you can do yeah. things at home that build on what's been done during the day. Now, some people only have their child in childcare for maybe one or two days a week, for example. So you don't have to stop where they're up to then, not knowing exactly where they're up to. You can use the app and continue on, whether it might be learning some nursery rhymes, yeah. learning some counting, whatever it might be. When you go back, you can actually have the up uh, the apps updated so that the teacher can then say, oh, good, you progressed to stage three of that particular task, so I'll continue on from there with your child. So it's a p- continual progress between the child at home and the child at daycare. So I thought that was quite nice. Other parts of it, yeah, there might be two, two trains of thought in terms of what might happen there. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine um, doing that in high school as well, and so I can keep tabs on what my sons are doing in their lessons, have conversations. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. no, we won't go any further with that, folks. All right, Starlink is SpaceX's solution for opening up communications to the world. Thousands of satellites the size of a loaf of bread in low Earth orbit. They're heaps cheaper than geostationary satellites with faster information transfer and provide a really good option for people in remote locations around the world. But it has NASA very, very concerned. And before the conspiracy theorists gets all wound up, we should clarify it's nothing about monopolising control of space. This is an actual legitimate problem for anyone already using space or planning space exploration for any time in the indefinite future, Matt. I'm just going to clarify something there. The communication isn't faster but the communication would have lower latency. Lower latency, yeah. Okay, because yeah, sorry. Because they're orbiting at a lower height rather than geostationary. It doesn't have to travel 35,500 kilometres to a geostationary. Yeah, 36,750 yeah, like or something like that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so right. the message so, still travels at the speed of light, but it doesn't have to travel as far. Correct. So the, you get the lower latency. So, yeah, so it doesn't mean make sure that all the information we put out there is technically correct. Yes, so yeah, I just, that's, I'm that's being right. very pedantic. Yeah, <laughs> so this is interesting because... NASA and SpaceX are pretty close partners. They NASA trusts SpaceX to put people from Earth up into the International Space Station. So you've got yeah. to have a pretty good relationship with someone before you put them on top of a rocket and blast them off into the International Space Station. So for NASA to say we're a bit worried about SpaceX, you can think that this might damage the relationship a little bit. Mm. You think they might do it behind closed doors, but it's a big enough issue. They've obviously said publicly we're worried about this. Well, surely JAXA and the European Space Agency, the Chinese Space Agency and the Russians, they're all, they're all a little bit worried about this, surely. You would think so, wouldn't you? Because space, believe it or not, is getting crowded. Mm. And excuse the bad pun, but 
in my mind, there's a lot of space out there mm. in space. So you'd think that putting up just a few little satellites just to help with some internet access would be okay. We've got heaps of room up there. It'll all be fine. But when you start to talk about 42,000 satellites yeah, that wow. SpaceX, or with Starlink, as you correctly said, wants to put up there, but then you've also got Boeing, you've got Amazon. They mm. want to have their own internet services. Now, they're not talking about 42,000, but they're talking around 7,800 satellites. Mm. So you're starting to get a lot of satellites. Now, they all want to be around that same height. They want to be that low Earth orbit. So, again, you start to build this up. Now, they might, where they're actually having those orbits going, obviously they're not going to be orbiting around the poles of the Earth. They want to orbit where the populations are. So again, you narrow down a little bit further mm. as to where those orbits are going to be. So they're worried about a couple of things, or NASA's worried about a couple but of things. But there's already tens of thousands of satellites up there as well. You've already got a big number there. You go and add another fifty or 60,000 mm. to what's already there. You're right. Now, some of those, not all those ones that you mentioned are all low Earth orbit, no. but there's still some stuff up there. So they're worried about a couple of things. Firstly, when they do send anything up there, sometimes they've got to go through the low Earth orbit orbital mm. for the whatever spaceship they've got going with, it's going to the moon or to Mars or to the space station, it's got to get through that level. Going through that level with lots of stuff flying around, then there's a potential for collisions there. Yeah. And these things are going along at a reasonable pace. Well, they're doing, yeah, roughly about 30,000 kilometres per hour. That's not too bad. Which is pretty, <laughs> pretty hot stuff. But I remember watching a documentary where they fired a fleck of paint the size of a 10-cent piece at a, a mock-up model satellite inside a vacuum chamber, and they right. fired it at 30,000 kilometres an hour, and when they opened it up, there was nothing but dust. It yeah, just had right. obliterated this thing. Yep. So any little bit of space debris travelling that fast has got so much kinetic energy that once it has a collision, it has to disperse that kinetic energy somehow, yeah. and it causes massive destruction. That's right. So mass times velocity. Yeah, there's your momentum. So yeah. if you've yeah. got... Just a small bit of mass. And as you say, these things yeah. are bigger than flecks of paint. Well, kinetic They're, energy is actually mass times velocity squared. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you take that, so the velocity in that at the square, mm. so you take the mass, again, a fleck of paint, not much mass, but at high velocity, mm. you take something that's more like, as you said, the size of a toaster. So you think, mm. oh, it's not that big, so it'll be okay. Take that mass times the velocity squared. Yeah, that's starting uh, to talk about some serious energy. And again, when we're talking about launching some more satellites up there and another satellite hits another satellite that might be a Starlink satellite, you go, oh, damn, that costs us a bit of money. But when you've got people going up in some of these, yeah. that starts to get a bit scarier than just it costs us a little bit of money. It costs people's lives. So right. there is no way to track all of these satellites. That's part of the problem. They've got no specific tracking and then changing of trajectory. So really, how you avoid these collisions is the really tough part because they might be able to see, oh, these two satellites look like they're on a collision course. What are we going to do about it? Because you don't have the ability to just to put the brakes on or no, that's you know, right. take a quick left turn there. We'll get yeah. around that. From what I gather, they don't have any retro thrusters on them whatsoever. They've got no extra weight in for fuel or anything like that. So there's a, retro thrusters are good for steering or for um, giving you a little bit extra acceleration. Um, so eventually they will come back and burn up, each one of them. But they're so easy to replace that they'll just send some more up there. Yeah, and sometimes they do have some extra power source like the sun for example that might give them enough power to actually just keep it in orbit because obviously sometimes it might start to just fall out of orbit so keep them in orbit but yeah you're right they're not made to be renewable and that's the big issue mm. here they're made to just stay in that orbit you sit there keep providing those internet services to earth and you're doing your job fantastically the next part which you just mentioned which you just touched on is when they do come back to earth you hope generally mm. that they burn up they're small enough and they're at a high enough speed that they'll burn up as they come to the atmosphere and you end up with not much when they do plan them to come back to earth they plan for those to land in the ocean mm. so that's all great if there's a bit that comes out a bit lands in the ocean and that's okay when it's occasional it happens mm. every now and again but you can just imagine if you've got lots coming down for various reasons over the next few decades you might be on a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean. You might be somewhere out there. It might be just a freight ship. Lands on your back. Yeah. That's right. And again, it's not going to be landing or hitting you at 30,000 kilometres an hour, as you mentioned before, but it's still going to come down at whatever the terminal velocity is for whatever shape is left there. So you're probably talking about a few hundred kilometres an hour, mm. which again is not going to obliterate a ship, but I wouldn't like to be standing on deck when something kind of hits you on the top of the head like that. So yeah. it's going to be a bit ugly. Wow. But this is the problem we've got as we keep, exploring further and further and sometimes we do get these things wrong don't we where we go hey let's go and do all this and then later on we go oh we didn't think about that did yeah. we now nasa saying let's just think about this we need to 
actually have a bit of a thought process in place before we just go all guns blazing. Mm. Now, laptops and tablets have been changed. Well, they have changed the face of the work environment. They blew open the doors of the dingy 20th century office and made any space a viable workspace. Airport lounges, coffee shops, train carriages, park benches and lounge rooms. For better or for worse, nowhere was sacred. You can plug in your device anywhere, anytime. But there's always been that problem of peering into a small, single screen. Matt, my deteriorating eyesight and my need to have multiple windows up operating all the time, they need a solution and they need it fast. What have you got for me? Well, it's even worse than the small screen, which I admit I used to love taking around a nice little 12-inch notebook. It was fantastic when my eyesight was a bit better. (laughs) And you use it and it's okay. You get away with it all. But you just started to miss the bigger screen. But the other thing that I really miss now, and most offices have got this, is multiple screens. Mm. Like I don't know how I'd survive without multiple screens to do so much of my work. You have a nice big one or two 30-inch, 32-inch screens on your desktop, maybe a notebook sitting beside those as well just for some other little bits and pieces. Mm. And then as soon as you pick that up and walk out the door and you stay in a motel overnight, you open up one screen. Wow, and even if you use so a 15-inch or 17-inch notebook, you still only have one screen there. So there's a whole range of solutions. And I won't go to them all in great detail, but just to let people know there is some hope for you out there because of the range of companies that are coming up with solutions to give you portability with multiple screens. And some of them are pretty simple. Some of them, if you've got, say, for example, an iPad, if you use a Mac in particular, but you can use this sort of solution with a PC as well, if you've got an iPad, you can actually plug an iPad into your PC or your Mac and use that as a second screen. Hmm. Now, the resolution may be not perfect and it might be a bit slow and a few little functions may not be there that you're, you've you become accustomed to with a second screen, but at least you've got two screens. So you can have one with your I don't know, your email sitting there, another one with your social media sitting there, and, and away you go. But there's lots of other companies that have seen that same sort of concept. So you can get screens that will fold up nicely into something that's kind of like an iPad or a tablet size screen. But then when you get to where you're going, you unfold it, it clips onto the back of your monitor. You can have ones that come off to the side. You can have two monitors, only say 10 or 12 inch monitors, but one on each side of your notebook. And again, they clip on with its own little stand, but they fold up beautifully. And you can get all those windows open at the same time. Oh, it's great. So yeah, yeah, some of these are actually just like real monitors in terms of what you can do and the way you configure them, but they all fold up and they go into your notebook case and you start to go from place to place. So for those people that have been saying, I love my mobility now, I can be sitting at a cafe until my boss, I'm sitting at work, working away or sitting at home, sorry, working away. You can be working from anywhere now. There's so many different places you can work from, but that's the big complaint I hear from people is those multi-monitors. So I'm, I'm just trying to give you some hope out there. <laughs> there is hope. You've got multiple Somewhere monitors right, you've got yeah. available. There's a bunch of different ways you can do it. Just go and Google portal, portable multiple monitors and you will find more solutions you can poke a stick at and there'll be one there that's right for you. Well, that's probably the handiest tip you've given out of all the tips (laughs) over the last 12 months. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. (laughs) (laughs) I reckon that's an absolute cracker. You mean that's too practical? Is that what you're saying? A lot of things we plan down the future for, that's a very practical one. Well, it's just a website there and it's got all my solutions for me there. (laughs) There we go. That's good. And ladies and gentlemen, that rounds off another classic tech talk with Matthew Dickerson. We've got to clear out quickly before they turn the sprinklers on and wreck all our electrical gear. Matt, thanks again for uh, busting out another corker. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to go out there and just check those dates that have been offered on Tinder and make sure they're legitimate people and and go (laughs) forward from there. Apologies to my wife. (laughs) And I've got a garbage bag full of about a decade's worth of lithium AA batteries to uh, drop down to Woolies, so uh, I'm out of here, folks. Good work, good work. (laughs) I'm James Eddy. It's been an absolute pleasure bringing you Tech Talk once again. Thanks for clicking on us. Now go and find that like or favourite or subscribe button and punch it. Maybe even have a crack at a comment if you can. See you in a week.